Welcome back. In this final section on the basics of breathing, we're going to look at how the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, for that fact, uses chemical signals to figure out how to change your breathing, whether in rate of breathing or in depth of breathing, in order to keep you in that beautiful zone of homeostasis. So the first thing to realize is that there is both nervous and chemical control. And the nervous control, this is totally involuntary. Once again, yes, you can breathe whenever you want to breathe because you have skeletal muscles involved, but you also have nervous signals. And so the nervous control for when you're not thinking about breathing depends on information which is coming from your chemoreceptors as well as coming from other parts of your brain, such as your limbic system. Because as we all know, we've seen some very emotional people. <laughs> and you can see that they love gasping for breaths and they're breathing much faster than you can. Most, most people have seen people that have hyperventilated and give them a little paper bag. And we'll talk about how that works if you want to. So essentially the nervous control is going to happen, the variations due to changes in oxygen levels, which is what everybody thinks, but what is much more important, 99% of the population, has to do with your carbon dioxide and your pH levels. And the most important is going to be carbon dioxide, unless you are a person that normally has chronic high levels of carbon dioxide. There are some really bad lung diseases, most of them associated with smoking, um, where oxygen levels can actually be lower than carbon dioxide levels, in which case the, the low oxygen um, levels are really driving. And if you give those people oxygen because you're trying to cure their hypoxia, well, then you've gotten rid of their drive to breathe and they're dead. Rookie nursing mistake, not good. But between now and then, you'll be reviewing breathing and blood gases many times. All right, so the chemical control is the body's ability to change those levels without changing the breathing and the chemoreceptors obtain the information. And this is where our lovely little equation comes into play to change your pHs. So, Let's talk about the nervous control of ventilation because we have various respiratory control centers. And if you think back way back when we were learning about the nervous system and I was talking about the brain stuff, I kind of blew off the pons and medulla oblongata and said like they're involved with um, like important physiological functions for life, you know? And so they have a big input when it comes to blood pressure and keeping you alive as far as your heart function, and they also have a huge role when it comes to breathing. And their responses are due into monitoring those chemoreceptors, whether they're central chemoreceptors in the brain or their peripheral chemoreceptors. They also get some input from some stretch receptors, you know, related to certain muscles involved with breathing, they don't care about the stress receptors in your quadriceps, but they care about the stress receptors in your diaphragm or in your intercostal muscles. And so we have this integration going from all over the place. And so here is a drawing meant to show your brain stem. At the top, we have the midbrain, which we're going to ignore. And then we have the pons, which we're going to mostly ignore ignore, but we're not really going to ignore because it has one of the three slash four centers of breathing in it. And then we're going to start in the medulla oblongata because that's where some basics are happening. So in the medulla oblongata, we have these two long centers, okay? And if you remember the pregnant belly of the pons is facing anterior, then the one that's labeled the ventral respiratory group, that's the more anterior one, and the one that's labeled the dorsal respiratory group is the more posterior one. So let's start with that more posterior one, the DRG, the dorsal respiratory group. And this basically is an inspiratory center. So when this gets stimulated, it's sending the little messages down in the lovely little nerves, which I have truncated off but stimulates your muscles of inhalation. So in other words, from here, we're sending messages to the phrenic nerve to affect your diaphragm and also your intercostal nerves to get those external intercostals, okay? And the lack of the signals from here is what's giving us that passive exhalation at rest. 
So that's very straightforward. All right, let's move to this ventral respiratory group because it's this ventral respiratory group that's important for stimulating muscles of forced exhalation. Okay, so the DRG was inhalation, but the ventral respiratory group is going to be forced exhalation. Now, there is this area here that I put a little question mark in front of because some people believe it and some people kind of throw it into the GRG. They just say, well, it's part of the GRG because it's right above the GRG. I like to consider it separately, probably because I like to talk about it. And so this is called the apneusic center. And so to understand that, you have to know what the word apneusis means, which means no breathing. Not a bad thing for survival. So when your body recognizes, hey, the dorsal respiratory group hasn't done anything and we're not breathing, there's no inhalation that has happened and she's not forcibly preventing herself from inhalating or him, because it can happen to guys too. Um, you can, yes, it actually works even, it, you know, whatever, if you're not breathing at some point, this, all the bells and whistles are going off in this place and it's like, dude, you're gonna die. And so the apneustic center will be sending all these signals until, and basically stimulating the dorsal respiratory group to stimulate your inhalation muscle. All right. So let's now travel up to the pons. And in the pons, we have this area, which on the picture is labeled the pneumotaxic center and anatomy being anatomy. Of course, for in recent years, they've given it a new book, new name. And many books still use the old name on occasion, a new edition will use the new name. I'm putting both in there because I do think the majority of people still call it the Nuno Taxi Center. But the new name, I guess, is so that everybody remembers, hey, the Pons gets some credit, is the Pontine Respiratory Group. So in other words, the dorsal and ventral respiratory group plus the apneusic center part of the dorsal respiratory group, that's all in the medulla oblongata. And now the Pons is finally getting some credit. And what this group does is it helps change your depth and your rate of respiration, adapting it to your activity. And here's a biggie that it does, okay? So for instance, if you're blowing up the balloon as your alveoli and you inhale, you can blow it or you can keep on blowing until the time where the balloon bursts. Well, this pontine respiratory group will prevent that overinflation from happening because like I said, it can adjust the depth of respiration and it's not gonna let you burst your alveoli. It's smarter than that. All right, so why is it kind of important and kind of fun to learn about these things? Have you ever stood in line at the grocery store or at Target? Yeah, I know you have. But have you ever stood in line where you've seen some poor hairy mother who may be you someday with some bratty little child? Not that any of your children will ever be brats. I know they will be perfect, upstanding citizens. But that child is having a mental meltdown. Maybe it missed its nap, maybe for whatever reason. Anyway, it's just turned into childzilla for the day. And it wants whatever is in that checkout line because those are disasters for parents. Mommy, can I have this candy? No. Can I have this candy bar? No. Can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? And the mom's just going, Bleh. and then the child pulls out the trump card. It doesn't say, mommy, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to call it top protective services. Oh, no, no, no. It does what's going to embarrass you as if the temper tantrum already doesn't have every other person within 50 feet staring at you. It's going to be, mommy, you don't love me. I'm going to hold my breath, turn blue, and die. To which most mothers say, yeah, fine, take the damn candy. We're out of here. Some mothers will say, forget it. We're leaving the basket here and you're, we're out of here with you because I'm going to teach you a lesson, in which case the kids would learn the lesson. But you know what? It's time to call that child, child's bluff. Say, go ahead. Tell them some of your anatomy and physiology. You know, go ahead. Hold your breath. Turn blue. You will pass out. Say it nice and loud so the other people don't call Child Protective Services on at which time your respiratory control center, specifically your apneusic center, is going to tell you your, your dorsal respiratory group to stimulate your phrenic nerves and your diaphragm contracts and to stimulate your intercostal nerves so that your external intercostals contract. And then your thoracic cavity will enlarge, the pressure will drop, and air will flow in, and you won't die. So 
There you have it. All right, pulling myself back into the nice sedate person you expect to see you in front of the classroom. Let's talk about the chemical control of ventilation. So centrally, we have those chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata, which basically, you know, giving information to the neural control centers. But then we also have peripheral chemoreceptors we learned about when we learned about um, the cardiovascular center. We have aortic bodies in the arch of the aorta, and we have those lovely carotid bo bodies where your common carotid arteries are bifurcating bilaterally. And they are giving information to those respiratory centers in your brainstem so that they can adjust depths and rates of your breathing so that you have the proper breathing. Here's what they're relying on. Yes, our friendly equation for carbon dioxide and water will form carbonic acid, which will then dissociate into a hydrogen ion and a carbonic acid. So you know, whoops, sorry, so that you know it, what happens if CO2 level goes up. If you have increased CO2, are you gonna run out of water in your body? Of course not. So will you be making more or less carbonic acid? And then if you're making more or less than that, what's going to happen to your hydrogen ion concentration? Figure that out. And then go back and think, how does hydrogen ion relate with blood pH? Because that's the last and final step. And for that, you need to remember pH of seven is neutral. If you have increased hydrogen ion concentration, that means you have increasing acidity, which means the pH is going down. Increased acidity, lower pH. If on the other hand, you have decreased hydrogen ion concentration, that means your alkaline, the pH is going up. So figure this out and then you can do the math to figure out what your brain is doing without having to go to class. Because like I said, whoever designed you, absolutely brilliant. And with that, we are done with the respiratory center. Hope you enjoyed this section and I'll see you when we hit our next organ sister. Thank you and have a great day.